This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Welcome you to the Sparks of Life and to explain to you a little bit what is this wonderful organization. So I'm reminded of a story of a bus driver who was once pulled over by a police officer and the charge against him was the bus was only allowed to have 50 students. And the officer cited him for having 60 students. And he appears before the judge and his CDL, his driver license at risk. And the judge asked him, were there 60 students on the bus? And the driver says, no, your honor, there weren't. The officer says, there most definitely were 60 students on the bus. The driver says, Your Honor, we're next door to a public school. I brought the bus here. I challenge the officer to come outside with me and see if it's physically possible to place 60 students on the bus. The judge is in a good mood. She says, You know what? Let's try it. They go to the courtyard where the kids are at recess. And the judge says, we need 60 volunteers. And after 10 minutes, he gets 60 volunteers, loads the students onto the bus, 50, 51, 52, you're in my seat, there's no room. Mm -hmm. And at 57, there's simply no way to put on any more boys on the bus, boys, girls, any more students. And um, the judge thinks for a minute, and he says, okay, let's go back to the courtroom. Case dismissed, but I would like to speak to the defendant in my chambers. So the bus driver comes in, and the judge says, I know this officer. He's honest. He's meticulous. If he said that there were 60 students on the bus, there were. How did you do it? So the driver says, Your Honor, there weren't 60. I'm also honest. There were 65. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to go. The students I was taking to school wanted to be on the bus. Those students that you took out of recess did not want to be on the bus. And if we would like to succeed in whatever our challenge may be, we have to have the motivation. We really have to want. And from the brochure of the Sparks in Life, one of the goals of the organization is to give motivation, reignite a will and a sense of purpose, as together we overcome the physical and mental challenges that Parkinson's brings. And that's one of the goals of the organization to assist those with this challenge to have the will to live, to have the will to have a sense of purpose. And that, of course, is not enough. What needs to have the tools and the skills to be able to carry on with the rules now of life are really different. And Sparks of Life addresses that also. It gives people with the challenge, the families, the skills, and the tools to be able to address this, this challenge, to be able to readjust what life is and what life could be. There's a, st there's a saying, we think we own the secret, but in reality, the secret owns us. Whenever we carry a secret, we think by not sharing it, by keeping it inside, by keeping it private, we are owning the secret and we are owning the information. But in reality, what happens is that the secret owns us. Our entire lifestyle is changed because we're looking to protect the secret. And the challenge it provides with families, with the betrayal, the feelings of betrayal and trust children and other people may have is that they were unaware and they weren't told and they didn't know and they didn't understand and they could have helped 
and the guilt associated with it is something that the Sparks of Life looks to dispel and assists those with the challenge to properly address. Today, as with many other illnesses, there's a greater awareness and a greater ability to have awareness and to be able to share it with others, which both makes the challenge for the sufferer easier and also for the family members, those who are associated with them, and even employers and friends. Tonight, we are privileged to have with us our first speaker, Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Rietti. Rabbi Rietti is the son of the famous British actor Robert Rietti, known as the man of a thousand voices. I'm not sure how many he's going to do today. <laughs> and the king of dubbers. He received his rabbinical diploma from the Gateshead Talmudical Academy in England and received a Master's of Education. He's practiced over 30 years as an educational consultant to parents of gifted children and those with ADD. He's a prominent speaker at Gateway's organization, author of The Art of Healthy Living, based on the teaching of Maimonides, the Rambam. Rabbi Rietti has given hundreds of lectures on topics including inner growth and health, and will speak about the mind-body connection in healing. He draws upon his background in the film and advertising industries to entertain the listener while sharing powerful insights on love, happiness, and emotional intelligence. Without further ado, Rabbi Rehab. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Teichman, for your kind introduction. Um, I do have rabbinical ordination. I'm not a doctor. Um, you do remind me, though, I was once speaking in Deal, New Jersey, for high school, and a gentleman who was introducing me uh, introduced me as Rabbi Rietti, and then he turned to me. I don't know what he was trying to gesture, so he turned back to the microphone and said, sorry, uh, Rabbi uh, Dr. Rietti, and I went like this. So, so he went back to the audience, and uh, he said, sorry, Rabbi Professor Dr. Rietti. <laughs> uh, it's a true story. And um, anyway, after he finished his introduction, I came to the microphone and I uh, thanked him for his kind introduction. I said, all I needed was 10 more seconds. I would have got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> anyway, um, a special thank you to uh, Susan and Moshe Lust for inviting me to share with you this evening on a very important topic of the mind-body connection. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask if you could all uh, turn your cell phones to vibrate uh, purely out of respect to those who are trying to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would actually like to begin this presentation by introducing you to a, a lady that I met. My wife and I met her about uh, two months ago at what's called a 3P, Three Principles, uh, conference. Uh, you can Google her. Her name is Wendy Sujesi. It's spelled S-E-G-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. She has stage four cancer, breast cancer, uh, for seven years. Many of you might know, I hope you don't, but if you do, um, the statistic expectation of the lifespan with someone at that stage, stage four, is approximately five years. 96% of those who have stage four cancer, breast cancer, don't make it beyond five years. She's seven years later, she still has, and she comes up on stage, and these are her opening words. I have cancer. I am not cancer. My body has cancer. I'm not my body. Let me introduce you to another person. There's more that she said, but I want to introduce you to a second person that I met about 18 years ago. His name is Christopher Reeve. Some of you might know him as Superman. Superman. He was wheeled onto a platform. This was about five years after his accident, where he fell off a horse and he became a quadriplegic. He's, he was 
paralyzed from the neck down. The only two parts of his entire body that moved were his eyes and his mouth. And with obvious difficulty, taking in a deep breath, an apparatus strapped to his chest, enabling him to take in enough oxygen to say one sentence at a time. The first words that came out of his mouth were, I've never been more happy in my life than since my accident. Now, he's a good actor, but how do you come up saying that? Quadriplegic. The only part of your entire body that moves are your eyes and your mouth, and, and you've never been more happy? And he explained himself. Because I discovered the real me is not my body. He said, I discovered the real me is not the tens of millions of dollars in my bank accounts. The real me is not the many homes I own. And then he began giving examples of who the real me is. These are two examples, I'm going to share very briefly two more, of people who don't live outside in. They live inside out. Because that's reality. I'll explain in a moment. The third person is someone some of you may know of. He lives locally, Six Wiener Drive. You can go visit him. Extraordinary personality. His name is Avram David Weiss. He has ALS. Six children diagnosed with ALS at about 34 years old. This is going back about 13 years ago. Quite extraordinary human being. You go into his front room and he's put a plaque which says, I have ALS. And under ALS is written, always live smiling. You walk in and here is the gentleman who is imprisoned literally inside his body. And the only two parts of his entire body that move are his eyes and a few muscles in his mouth. And he's wearing a permanent smile, consistent, constant, no exaggeration. His children adore him. He's not able to talk. He can see. He communicates thanks to technology actually originally developed in Israel that has a screen, a computer screen in front of him with a, a, a camera that's right onto his eyes and it reads his eye movement. On the screen is ABC and Alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And the camera is able to read that if he holds his eye on a specific letter for one and a half seconds, then moves it to another letter, the computer will print the letters at the bottom of the screen. Then he looks at space, gives a space. And eventually when he's finished talking, he'll look at a microphone icon in the top right-hand corner. And then the computer will read what he's communicating to you. First words out of his mouth, so to speak, from a computer were, I have a wonderful wife. And he starts talking about how good his family are, how good life is. Extraordinary. I was speaking to one of his aides. He has 24-7 caretakers. One was telling me that, and this is going on for years now, the Jewish community the Hasidic uh, community he belongs to actually raise about $30,000 a month to keep him alive. Extraordinary. And here is a person who studies with all his children every day through the computer. He does, the, he does homework with them. He has learning partners during the day. And one of his aides told me that this is his favorite patient to work with because he's always smiling and always gracious and grateful. He told me that He's never met someone who has ALS in a condition where they sleep less than 20 hours out of 24 and become bitter and angry, hurt, resentful towards life and spouse and family frequently end up feeling isolated and not wanting to even have that much contact because dad, mom, or God forbid, whoever it is, has withdrawn from the world that was part of their lives. And he told me something extraordinary. This gentleman, Avram David Weiss, is awake approximately 20 hours out of 24. 
It's extraordinary. And what is he doing? He has over 75,000 books that he's able to learn on screen, study, and listen to. And he's an avid learner. He studies Bible and commentaries day and night. Last person I want to share with you, living inside out, was another gentleman, a special giant in the Torah world, uh, whose name was Rabbi Shimon Schwab of Blessed Memory. I knew him personally, invited me to his home a couple of times with my family, but one particular occasion was in the middle days of Passover in a hotel in the Catskills. Um, I think it was, uh, no, it wasn't one of the Kutcher's, uh, but may it rest in peace. Um, I think it was uh, Oppenheimer's. Um, so in, in, in uh, the last 10 years of his life, he was crippled. He was always using, always helped with a, a wheelchair. He had to be carried in and out of the wheelchair, whatnot. His grandson, Natan, asked him, and I was there in the room, Grandpa, how is it that in the, last past, the past 10 years that you've not had use of your legs, Grandma admits that she never heard you ever complain, not even once. And you always have this serene smile on your face. What's the secret of your happiness? And I was astonished at his answer, mind-boggling. He said, I look at life in the following way. Imagine someone gave you a million dollars as a gift, cash. And 70 years later, can you all hear me clearly? 70 years later, this gentleman who gave you a million dollars asks you if you could please return a thousand. Would you be ungrateful, bitter? Would you be resentful? Would you complain? Would you be angry? Or would you say, you gave me a million dollars 70 years ago. I was able to invest it in conservative investment. My whole family have enjoyed financial security because of your million dollars. I've been able to get my children and help them marry. I owe you everything. You only want a thousand back. Rabbi Shimon Schwab said, I look at the loss of my legs the same way. It's an inconvenience. Inconvenience? Mm. Crippled without, how can you call that? And he said, because if I ask myself, what's the true value of marriage? A happy marriage. Children. Happy children. Healthy children. What's the true value? I mean, in my total life portfolio, as he called it, I've got a page here for marriage. Happy marriage. Children. Healthy children. Children going in the same direction as my parents raised me. How much is that worth? And keep turning the pages. How many pages are there in your total life portfolio? Usually you and I look at a portfolio and associate it as a, a financial statement. These are my assets. These are my, this is what I owe, my debts. And this is my personal worth. Well, that's a financial statement of something that's outside of me, a bank account, a building, properties, bonds, investments. What is your, what are your eyes worth? They're priceless. What are your lungs, your kidneys? So he basically said, I am too blessed to be stressed. I am too grateful to kvetch, too grateful to complain. These are people who lived inside out. We all know people like that throughout history. But what I want to bring out is really the following, and I'm going to quote to you from Maimonides, who 800 years ago, physician, philosopher, legal codifier, leader of the Jewish people worldwide, where he talks about the body-mind connection. The mind-emotion-body connection. And it's only, I think, in the last few decades that um, modern medical science is really starting to recognize the compelling evidence for not neglecting a patient in a much broader... A patient is a body with a mind, with emotions, with a life, with aspirations, disappointments expectations, visions, memories. Bernie Siegel, Dr. Bernie Siegel, 
Dr. Norman Cousins. Dr. Bernie Siegel, I'm not sure if he initiated, but he made popular attitudinal healing. He would work with what's called special cancer patients, meaning to say he tried to help them focus not on the terminal disease and the expectation of death, but how to live while I'm still alive. Bernie, um, um, so Bernie Siegel, uh, Norman Cousins uh, famously signed himself out of hospital. He took his doctor with him and uh, lodged in a motel across the street. I think he saved about $1,000 a night. <laughs> and uh, in doing so, he, he, he took out every slapstick comedy he could find and literally laughed himself back to recovery from leukemia. It came back many years later, and he recovered a second time. When it came back the next time, he was being rushed. He was in the middle of a tennis game in his 70s, and he had fallen to the ground, collapsed. He was taken in an ambulance, and the ambulance was, was speeding as fast as it could go and with a lot of noise, and he realized he himself was beginning to panic. And he asked the driver, could you please slow down and turn off the siren? Is it true that healing really takes place over here? Let's look at this a little bit closer. There's a very strong movement, positive psychology, um, Dr. Professor uh, Tal Shaka, also known as Tal Ben Shaka, uh, professor at Harvard, um, has the highest record of students attending his class, Happiness 101, 1,400 students. That's quite remarkable, considering I think Harvard has a total of about uh, 6,000 students. 1,400 students attending Happiness 101, demonstrating that there is an mounting evidence in the medical world, not just suggesting, but giving very compelling argument for how people respond differently inside their bodies because of what they're thinking or what they're feeling or what they're doing through dance, music. Laughter. You've got laughter clinics all across the world. Patch Adams, one of the fathers of that, of that. I'm going to share with you what the Torah says about the mind-body relationship. It's actually quite shocking. And I'll tell you why. Because we don't usually look at the Hebrew words the way I'm about to share them with you. So let me ask you, how do we, how do we translate the word lave? How do we usually translate the word lave? Heart. So it correctly translates as, as heart. Here's an interesting question. The word lave, which is translated as heart, and you'll find it throughout Scripture, throughout the Bible, has four meanings. Sometimes it's a metaphor. Lave hayam, as the heart of the ocean. There's no heart inside the ocean. It's a metaphor. Lave hashamayim. There's a heart in heaven. No, there's no heart in heaven. It means in the midst of, in the middle of. Sometimes it's referring to your physical heart. For example, the high priest Aaron wore what's the, the breastplate al liboy against his heart, the physical heart. But the vast majority of times the word lev we translate as heart and we assume it's referring to the icon of emotions. But actually, it means mind. Rabbi Victor Miller talks about this many times. The word lave correctly translates as mind or thought. You say the words every morning in our, in our prayers. We say, Rabot, this is taken actually from King Solomon, book of Proverbs, chapter 19, verse 21. Rabot mahashavot. What does mahashava mean? Thought. Excellent. Ten points for Gryffindor. Very good. Mahashava means thought. Rabot mahashavot. There are many thoughts. Belev ish. In the mind of a person. Where do you do your thinking? In your heart or your mind? Where do we do our thinking? We do it in our mind. So why does God use one word to mean two things? Listen carefully, because what I'm about to share with you is not complicated or deep. It's, it's, it's profound, but not because I'm saying it. It's profound. It's so simple. That's why I'm asking you to pay extra attention. It's so ridiculously simple, it might go right over my head. 
The word lev means both mind and heart. And the reason why is because everything you feel is what you're thinking. God created the universe with this language. If there's no other word that it describes the emotions and what you're thinking, then lev, now you start translating the term, it will change your mind and your heart about your own religion. Because 100% of what you feel is what you're thinking in that moment. Try it for yourself. It's impossible for you to ever experience anything outside of what you're thinking. There's an, it's it's the two sides of the exact same coin. coin. Lave, lave. The moment you're thinking it, you're feeling it. If I'm feeling angry, it's because I'm thinking angry thoughts. If I'm feeling frustrated, I'm thinking... Uh, if I'm feeling resentful, I must be thinking resentful thoughts. Let me, let me give you a couple of demonstrations of how simple this is, how ridiculously simple it is. God created us inside thought all the time. That's where we are all the time. That's why Christopher Reeve was capable of saying, I discovered the real me. It's not my body. It's my mind. And after four years of being in and out of depression, he wanted to commit suicide, and he couldn't. He was a quadriplegic, imprisoned in his body and wheelchair. He actually described to us how he would beg. Is there anyone there? Anyone? Uh, pull the plug, please. Anyone? Please pull the plug. I just can't take it anymore. And he, he couldn't even commit suicide, poor man. We live inside our mind until he realized, oh, you know, if I continue thinking this way, I'm going to destroy myself. And he started with, one second, I've got a mind. He actually said the words, and I quote verbatim, if God left me with a brain and a heart, I could still choose to be happy. Let me give you a simple example of how far this goes. Imagine I'm upset with my, with, uh, my, with my wife. You know what? You drive me nuts! You're just like your mother! Oh, Michael, hi! Yes? Really? Oh, sure! In five minutes, I'll, I'll be there. Oh, one second. I'm in the middle of really, I'm really upset. I mean, really upset. You thought I was acting. I've been practicing for 36 years. Um, I was really, really upset. Someone told me marriage is not a word. It's a sentence. Uh, pure humor, no reflection on reality whatsoever. So here I'm really upset with my spouse. I mean, really, really angry. And I suddenly, it's Michael. And I have to explain. I've been working on this client for months and months and months, and, and he, never, he has not called me once. If I get this deal, it's the highest, biggest commission I've ever had. I'm seeing his name come up on the phone. I say, Michael, hi, how are you? Yes? Really? Oh, sure. If, yeah, in five minutes, I'll be there. He said to me, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I thought about it. I really want to close, but the problem is I haven't got much time. Can you meet me uh, in my office in five minutes? Um, what happened to my anger? How does it just, why don't, Michael, this is not a good time. I can't believe you're calling now. I'm so upset with Michael. I'll talk to you. I'll call later. What, what? Your mind went to the phone call. Example number two. You know, I'm starving. I'm really, have you, I'm not you personally, but do you know a friend who's ever had the experience of, you know, I'm really, I could eat it. I am so hungry. I'm really starving. Oh, Sandra. Hi, how are you? I'm so glad you called. I got so much to catch up. We haven't spoken in almost an hour. I can't tell you. There's so many things coming. And, and here I am. And I'm on the phone for an hour and three quarters. Well, it was a really stimulating conversation. A lot of people to talk about, of course, in a very nice way. And put the phone. Where was I? Where? Oh, yeah, I was starving. One second, one second. I was starving an hour and three quarters ago. So where was I for the last hour and three quarters? And the answer is, you exist here all the time. Where you are thinking is where you are. Have ever, any of you played soccer or ice hockey? Yeah? And you, do you remember, madam, or sir, did you ever get kicked in the... Oh, in the shin. Oh, and you've got 20 minutes to go into the game, and you're running around. Whistle blows from the referee, and you limp off the field. Uh, excuse me, Rieti, I saw you got kicked in the shin 20 minutes ago, so don't tell me, you're such a fake, you're limping off the field. And the answer is, where was my mind for the last 20 minutes? On the game, why? Why am I so focused on the game? 
Maybe it's one up, one down, championships, teamwork. I'm focused on the game. The moment the referee blows the whistle, my mind goes to the pain. But you had this pain for... No, 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 no. My mind blocked it out completely because that's not where I was. Is this, is this making sense? You can take all my, um, What I'm trying to demonstrate is that every single one of us operates the same way. Resentment is a thought. Anger is a thought. Guilt is a thought. How long is the life of a thought? As long as I think it. Is that right? So how far am I away from the next thought? One thought away. The Torah, one of the most famous of uh, lines in the Torah tells me, Don't hate your brother. Lev means mind, thought, and emotion. Why both? Oh, because God is helping us recognize that by giving me emotions, he's giving me a signpost that sends me to where these emotions are coming from. The purpose of feelings, hatred, resentment, anger, I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling so sorry for myself. I'm feeling guilty. Is in order for me to know what I'm thinking. The feeling is there to tell me, where's my mind? Because I live here all the time, you and I don't pay attention to things. When was the last time I had to think about my thinking? How many of you woke up ever one morning and said, you know what? I just read there's almost 8 billion people on this planet. And I don't know if there's enough oxygen for all of us. I better begin investing. No, no. no one has anxiety about the possible lack of oxygen. Do you know why? Because it's everywhere all the time. Around you, in you. You never think about something that's there all the time. That's the problem with taking anything for granted and losing the gratitude I owe to the people who are there all the time for me. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that's closer than oxygen. Thought. I don't have to pay that much attention. And so God designed us with emotions to tell me what I'm thinking. Because 100% of what you feel is what you're thinking in that moment. It's impossible to exist any other way. And the Torah seems to be saying it in one word, lave. It means both. So when it says, don't hate your brother in your thoughts, usually translated as heart, it actually means thoughts because that's where it's really happening. God is not telling me what to feel. He's telling me what to think because that's the generator of my feelings. What's possibly liberating about knowing that anxiety is thought? Stress is thought. I commute to Brooklyn two or three times a week, and it's, it's become two to three hours sometimes uh, a commute. It's like unbelievable. And I have to say, for about two years, I was so stressed out. And since I started paying attention to what I'm sharing with you, it took me months and months to... Now, I'm saying to myself, it's only traffic. Now, let me prove to you that it really is, it's really not stress. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Have you ever been in traffic where you feel stressed by the traffic? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, good. Question. Have you ever been in the same traffic and you are listening to a stimulating interview on the radio or a very interesting class uh, that's been recorded or you've got a passenger who's so interesting that you don't even notice the amount of time it's taking to get home and you're kind of hoping it's going to take a long time because you're so engaged in the conversation you don't notice the traffic. So here's the question. Is it the traffic that's stressing me out? Or is it my thinking about the traffic that's stressing me out. It's not my spouse who's annoying me. It's my thinking about my spouse that's annoying me. I've got a hammer here. Hammers are for usually construction building, but they could also be destructive. I think it's a great metaphor for thought. So, ouch, I've got a worry thought over here. And I, I ah! I really, I have a lot of worries in my life about my kids, my, my children. I, I don't know if any of you got teenagers. Well, I understand why some animals eat their young. 
pure humor, no affliction on reality whatsoever. Um, here's my worry thought, and here is my, oh, I'm worried about my health. I, you know, this is my health thought. It says here, health. Got it, Moshe, go on the health. I, I've got concerns about my, I'm not overweight. My doctor says, I'm a prime candidate for cancer, and I'm dying to see the gun thing. I'm so worried about my health. And I've got a lot of anger, especially towards my mother. In law. Uh, so, sorry, just, just swallowing. Um, my father-in-law. I've got so much anger towards uh, my boss, my client, and I've got a lot of hammers here, frustration. I'm not going to go through all my hammers, but these are thoughts. See, the moment I realize what's hurting me is not my spouse, my kids, the boss, the traffic. What's hurting me is my thoughts. Well, how long is this thought going to last? As long as I think it. Oh, so the moment I realize, who's holding this thought and banging myself with it? There's no prescription of what I have to do next. I don't have to go to any self-help classes or techniques or strategies because I'm not, I don't want that thought anymore. And I'm always only one thought away from the next thought. It's, this is so ridiculously simple. Let me share with you one last metaphor. I'm going to go share with you my monitors. This is my, in Yiddish they call pekel. This is my lot in life. Included in what I'm carrying around with me are my teenagers, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my brother, my sister. Uh, uh, over here is my career, my disappointments in my career. Everything that's not going right in my life is, is in this package. It's not too heavy to carry around. But you know what? I start wondering, you know, it's not, I don't think it's really fair because I know people who really have much more supportive spouses than I do. And uh, I've only got one. I can't afford more than one. But, uh, you know, and I also, you know, I, I, I've discovered that I've got a lot of anxiety associated to what I'm, I'm carrying in my life because I find that, you know, other people seem to be able to be much more self-disciplined in, in, in health and taking care of them and exercising and, and a good diet. And uh, my kids, you know, drive me nuts. I mean, they're crazy. I can't take them anymore. Someone once asked me if I ever hit my kids. I said, I never hit my kids. Except in self-defense. <laughs> uh, again, pure humor, no reflection on reality whatsoever. So here I am, and I'm adding another thought of what's going wrong in my life. With my wife. With my spouse. In my house. With my health. Uh, with my wealth. I'm a poet, and I know it. And slowly, slowly, I go... <laughs> I can't take the weight of all this anymore. God, why are you doing this to me? And God's answer is, Rieti, this is all I gave you. The test that you're experiencing is overweight thinking. It's not the problem that's the problem. It's what I'm thinking about the problem that's the problem. I feel I can't get out the house. I don't want to face people. And the thoughts of me going public, it's the thoughts that are hurting me. It's not the actual fear. Fear is taking place here. Otherwise, God has no right, chapter 20 in the book of Deuteronomy, to tell me when you go out to your enemies as a soldier, don't fear them. What do you mean don't fear them? I'm, I'm trepidation. God is saying, no, 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 no. Fear is thought. Once you know fear is thought, how long is it going to last? Well, as long as I think about it. Oh, so God is telling me, go to the next thought. Drop it. The moment you realize that's a non-reality thought, let go. God actually says, Lotikoim, don't take revenge. Whoa, that's a biggie. Right next to it, he says, same verse. Chapter 19 um, in the book of Leviticus, verse 18. He then says, Lotitor, and also don't res have, have resentment. Don't take revenge. Don't bear a grudge. Don't have resentment. Don't remember other people's faults. Whoa. Really? Ladies and gentlemen, what are the next words? Same verse. Most famous words possibly in the whole Bible. Love your neighbor as yourself. Whoa. Master of the universe. You know what? I, I really have a quick chat with you. Um, with all due respect, um, my therapist is going, to, is going to have a lot of problems with this. You see, um, have a lot of clients who really are going to struggle. Do you, could 
Do you mind taking the first part of the verse, don't have revenge, don't remember other people's mistakes, and put it somewhere at the beginning of Genesis, and then take um, love your neighbor as yourself, put that like at the end of Deuteronomy, the end of the Bible, and give my clients some space to recover. What's God's answer? Rieti, you don't understand. These are commandments, instructions about how to think. And I'm telling you, if you want to go to sleep tonight, if you want to enjoy life, this is where it takes place. The type of thoughts that will destroy you, bring you down, erode your happiness. Oh, revenge. Thoughts of resentment. It's a thought. And I can go from this thought to this thought. I'm telling you, I can tell you to go to the next thought. Love your neighbors yourself. That's a big swing. And what does God say? Well, read the last two words of the same verse. I am God. Ani Hashem. I'm signing off, says God, because I want you to know I designed you this way. You are always healthy. Oh, I might not have always a healthy body, but your mind is always healthy. How far am I away from a healthy mind? One thought away. One thought away from thinking kindness, appreciation, gratitude, love, consideration. I'm always one thought away from dropping the anxiety. I'm making it sound simple because it is. You and I live this way all the time. Let me share with you the words of Maimonides Rambam, 12th century philosopher, and there are hospitals till today that are named after him. Um, He says something quite extraordinary in his opening remarks to the laws of thinking. That's the correct translation of Hilchot Deot, the laws of thinking. Isn't that interesting? He has chapter 4, 23 directives on health. But it's under the category of the laws of thinking. And the very opening remarks are, since having a vibrant and healthy body is part of serving God. So you see, in the first sentence, he hasn't even finished the sentence yet, he's already put this in a context of being a religious person has everything to do with physical health. 23 directives about how to take care of my health, and it's in the laws of attitude, the laws of thinking, and the opening remarks are, since being vibrant and having a healthy body is going in the ways of God, because, he says, if I would be ill, my focus has to be on recovery. So I can't focus on prayer. I can't focus on study. I can't focus on kindness to other people. I've got to focus on recovery. So he says, therefore, I should avoid anything that is harmful to the body and ingest anything that's going to invigorate the body. And then he says, these are the 23 directives. And here's the first three. Mind-blowing. Eat when hungry. Drink when thirsty. Go to the bathroom when you have the urge. Excuse me? Maimonides? I mean, a towering, giant... In philosophy and medicine and uh, legal codes and lead of the Jewish people, I, I need you to tell me, eat when I'm hungry, drink when I'm thirsty, and go to the bathroom when I have an urge? And the answer is simply profound. He's telling us the following. Listen to the integrity of your body. It was designed with perfection. If I'm tired, what's the solution? Double espresso. Not quite. Now my body is saying I'm tired. I need to rest more. If I'm feeling stressed, guess what's going on? I'm feeling stressed. That's God's way of my body telling me what I'm thinking. Because stress is always going to hurt the body. I close here. Extraordinary. He says on, I'll just give you a quick slew of of examples that he gives about the body-mind connection. He talks about exercise. It's it's quite, quite extraordinary. The context of the exercise is the following. He tells us that um, you should exercise every day. He tells you the definition of exercise 800 years ago. You know, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of programs on exercise today. And here's my mind, it's 800 years ago, telling you, it doesn't matter your body weight, it doesn't matter your waist size, it, ma- it doesn't matter how tall, short, it makes no difference. It's the same definition, generic definition of exercise for every human being. Really? And what is that? 
He says, any physical exertion that causes you to have deep breathing is exercise for that body. He says, continue that exercise until any one of the following three items appear. Well, number one, your facial expressions are strained. So here I am on the, um, what do you call it, the <laughs> treadmill. <laughs> oh, good, only 35 minutes left. <laughs> well, excuse me, Rieti, put a mirror in front of your face and look at your face. You're stressed. And my mind is saying, one of the following three, stop the exercise. If your facial expressions look strained, that is your face telling you on the outside what's going on inside. In Hebrew, the word for face, there actually isn't one. The word we use is panim. It's actually plural. Faces. Because there's no such thing as a face. Your face changes every second of your life. You have over 46 muscles in your face that can produce unlimited emotional expressions. Says Maimonides, number two, if you notice any pain in any of your joints, stop the exercise. Listen to your body. The word pun in faces actually shares the same meaning as panim. Inside. Because the only place, well, unless you're a doctor who can read the eyes or a reflexologist, the only place you and I can see our spouse, what they're thinking or feeling, is you look at their facial expressions. Number three, says Maimonides, if I stop sweating, stop exercising. Oh, I'm dehydrating. Listen to the integrity of the body. He gives a list of six items that increase body strength. The last two are control of anger and nurturing happiness. These are in his list of invigorating the physical body. He gives a def not only a definition for, for exercise, he tells you the best exercises of all. Mind-boggling. He says the best exercise of all is any exercise which has happiness associated to it. He gives an example. Dancing. Listening to music. Dancing to music. Isn't that interesting? That you know Sparks is all about this gentleman here whose entire therapy is get the body moving to rhythm, to music. Become a warrior. Become a fighter. Because you are not your body. You are your mind. And your mind changes. According to medical science, when you listen to music, your blood vessels open, dilate 30% more. Isn't that interesting? Um, I told this to my son when he was in the ICU with a spleen, uh, fractured spleen. Um, and I brought him his favorite music because when, you, when you're in the ICU and you're there for days or weeks, Hus Shalom, God forbid, it's possible to get pneumonia and the body's simply not. But when you are listening to music, you're stimulating yourself internally. Says Maimonides, the best form of exercise is a ball game. Because the emotion of happiness has a healing force that is different than when you're just exercising the body without happiness. He understood this 800 years ago. I close. He offers 10 items that will diminish body strength. Fasting, insomnia. Number three, anxiety. He adds that const constant anxiety causes dissolution of body fat and loss of muscle substance. Number four, severe emotional strain. Five, anger. I mean, these are things he's telling Diminished the physical body. And is referring to emotions which are governed by what I'm thinking in the moment. Constant desire for women. That's number six. Number seven, lust for money. Lust for political power. Number eight. Number nine, recurring thoughts that give a person no peace. And number ten, hit the top ten, jealousy. Eight out of these ten are clearly emotions that I'm thinking that's diminishing my body strength. I close, and I truly mean it. I've got a quick story to tell you. It's a true story that never happened. Uh, Becky and Chaim die about 98 years old. They've married over 60 years, arrive in heaven, and the way it works down there is uh, Michael, the archangel, he shows you down Heavenly Boulevard, and um, each house is successfully... Uh, successfully uh, larger than the previous one. So they're looking at large houses, and it starts with a small apartment, then it's houses, then it's mansions, finally it's all palaces. And the way it works is whoever died last gets the last 
building. So they had to get this mansion of a palace, 14 bedrooms, they're giving a tour, indoor jacuzzi, outdoor jacuzzi, indoor swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, indoor tennis pool. And Chaim's getting more and more red and agitated, and his wife begs, says, Chaim, what's the matter with you? Says, Leave me alone. I said, oh, what the, are you angry? Yes, I'm very angry. Why are you angry? Because of you. Me? I haven't done anything. We just arrived in heaven. I said nothing. You, Becky, you and your cholesterol and your exercise programs, we could have had this 20 years ago. <laughs> We're not in a hurry to leave this world. God gave us the perfect whatever it is that we're carrying. But I can add unnecessarily to that with what I'm thinking. That is the problem. The problem is not the problem. It's my thinking that's the big problem. My mind is everything, and it has an enormous say in everything that my cells do, in the, in the, in the knowledge of knowing that it should be all be, uh, merit much more happiness in our lives. Amen. This is yours. Thank you, Rabbi Non Doctor Re- Prieti. Jonathan Prieti. No, no doctor. No doctor, just Rabbi. <laughs> For your wonderful words. We'll now have a panel discussion with um, Dr. Michael Rizak, Movement Disorder Neurologist, Director of the Movement Disorder Center and Deep Brain Stimulation Program at the Vassar Brothers Medical Center. If I can ask Dr. Rizak, am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes, perfect. Rizak to come up here and have a seat. Together with Dr. Jennifer Pallone, who specializes in Parkinson's disease and neurology. For over 30 years, Dr. Rizak has been at the forefront of research trials for PD and has published and presented many works on the subject. Together, Dr. Rizak and Dr. Pallone treat the whole person and focus on integrated methods to achieve healthy living with Parkinson's. Dr. Rizak was named top doctor in 2011 by U.S. News and World Report. Both doctors practice in Poughkeepsie, New York, near the Jewish communities in Rockland and Orange counties. Um, In addition to the questions that were sent in, we will also be taking some questions for the audience for both Dr. Rizak and Dr. Pallone and Rabbi Riyadi. Words about yourself. Sure. You want me to introduce myself? Um, well, you know, I've devoted my life and my career to uh, treating Parkinson's disease, and um, I started out as a young child. Uh, but I, I have always been fascinated with the brain, and I actually ended up getting a PhD in neuroanatomy, and then I did a postdoc in neurophysiology, and then I had a lab and told my parents I want to go to medical school. They said, who are you? No. So then I went to medical school and, uh, and, and really focused in on the part of the brain that has to do with movement, uh, very focused, uh, coordinated voluntary movement, which was the basal ganglia. And that's the part of the brain that's really not working well in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And um, when I started our building our clinical program, I always felt that we, of course, we have to understand our patients very well, not just the physical, but the emotional, their spiritual side. And we need to make sure that all those factors are, are optimized. Um, but here in Poughkeepsie, um, we're building a program that has to do with deep brain stimulation, Duopo, which is the levodopa gel if we need it. But our job is really to manage patients for as long as humanly possible with medications. And to um, and there's a lot we can do, but it takes micromanagement and frequent um, visit and communication. Uh, if we don't know that there's a problem or somebody's afraid to tell us about a problem, we can't make it better. So we really try to promote the comfort level of the patient with us. I know Dr. Pallone's the same way. She's better than I am, I think, about certain things, but we want people to talk to us. So we 
we understand. We're, we're all human beings. We all have feelings and emotions. And if people don't tell us they're having problems going to the bathroom, we can't help them because they're, they're too shy to tell us. Since there's anecdotes going around. Um, you know, I had a patient come in after a deep brain stimulator implantation. And I thought this person would be very happy. She wouldn't even look at me. You know, she wouldn't look at me. She was near her husband. And I'm, this is where we're going to actually turn the stimulator on and make it work. And this is, uh, I'd say, about three or four weeks after the implant. And normally she's a very bubbly person. And I said, what's, what's going on? You know, what, are you guys OK? And he says, well, she hasn't gone to the bathroom. And she's like telling her husband not to tell me. I'm like, I, I need to know. What's what, what do you mean? Bowel movement. She hasn't had a bowel movement. I said, Wait, so how long has it been since you've had a bowel, any bowel movement? Three weeks. I said, three weeks? Why didn't you call me? Call your primary? She was too embarrassed to talk about it. She was in pain, but she wouldn't. Immediately goes to the emergency room, went to surgery. Her bowel was obstructed and started twisting on itself from severe constipation, which could have been avoided if there was communication. And these are things that we want to know about, we want to deal with, no matter how private. Obviously, we're doctors. We know about how the body works from a medical standpoint. And we, by taking care of the little things, we know that the big things may never become a problem. They may never happen. So I've spoken long enough. I've been told that I could keep going forever. So I'll let Dr. Pallone. So yeah, Dr. Jennifer Pallone. Uh, I've actually been in neurology for hmm, I hate to say how many years, but uh, going on 25 and beyond that. And most of my career, I've actually concentrated on taking care of Parkinson's disease. Uh, I was asked why. You know, what is it about that? And I say it's it's very personal and it's very visual. So when I'm visiting with a patient, there's a lot of energy communication. You can tell in the room right away how people are feeling. We're observing them, we're interacting with them. And that, the old bedside diagnosis we used to say, it's now chair side most of the time, but we can see what's happening with a patient, with a, a person that's in front of us. And it, that to me was always meant a lot. And I, it just clicked with me that this was a condition that I can uh, relate to in a way and treat and take care of and help people. And we have, both of us, very successful stories about patients, but echoing uh, what Dr. Oh, excuse me, what Rabbi uh, Rietti said is that it, it really is all about, ultimately, my patients who have been most successful are the ones who take hold of this illness and keep moving forward with an attitude that allows them to be well. And I think that is my approach to taking care of the condition. There are a lot of things that go on, like Dr. Rizak is saying. We have a list, a questionnaire that we give every patient. They probably get tired of seeing it every time they come in, but it's long. There's probably 28 questions on there about how they're doing, so that they have that opportunity to circle a yes or a no about what's happening in them, and then we can address it and, and help them in case they don't want to say it out right away, or they're afraid they won't have enough time to say what they need to say. So let's just circle what's going on, and let's address it so that things are not forgotten. So it's very, very important to us to take in the whole person, the whole patient, the illness, but I tell my patients I have to wrap my mind around you and let's get to know you. Let's get to know you with your illness and what your problems are. And then that, upon that, we'll be able to develop a plan that is going to help you be well. And one thing is, when I came to uh, Vassar Medical Center, I made it clear before I came that this is a special program. We're, we're not going to be held to 15-minute visits. We were going to take the visits are going to be as long as they need to be, of course, within reason, um, where we can listen to our patients. We observe our patients and let pa patients talk to us, and we pick up so many subtle cues and information just by doing that. It can make a world of difference in terms of how we treat our patients. And 
so far. I think NASA has held to their word. Nobody bothers us. We are able to develop our program the way we see fit, which is very patient oriented. And we're here to help our patients. We can't be rushed, you know, and patients can't be rushed, especially first visits. It's, you need to have the time to hear everything. And, um, and, and I think that's one of the benefits of be, for us uh, being at Dasser. Thank you. Um, we'll go through a few questions that have been submitted already, some for the doctors, some for the rabbi. We're going to try to keep it approximately three minutes so we can go through as many questions as possible. First question is, I guess I'll start with Dr. Rizak. What is the difference? What is it? That's a tough question. <laughs> what is the difference between a neurologist and a movement disorder specialist? If I have a neurologist that I'm happy with, is it really necessary for me to switch to a movement disorder specialist? Um, good question, and not because I'm a movement disorder specialist, but uh, so there's it, it. She she rushes me all the time. I can't. I take my time. It's like internal medicine. If you go to an internal medicine practitioner, they can be general doctors, but then if you need a specialist like a, a heart doctor or a kidney doctor, you'll go to those specialties. Same thing in neurology. A general neurologist can know. A little bit about everything, but if you need a stroke specialist, you you want to go to that person. Or if you need a neuromuscular specialist, you go to that person. A movement disorder specialist has extra training in Parkinson's disease and related disorders. Uh, and it really is no matter how happy you are with your general neurologist. I think it's great. Uh, not we don't want to take patients away from doctors that are doing a good job for our patients, but. I have to say, we have trouble keeping up with all the literature and new information that comes out just in Parkinson's disease. It's hard to understand how a general neurologist, especially if things get a little complicated, could um, keep up on the latest and be able to navigate some of the therapeutic issues that we have to deal with. So that's the reason that I think if I had Parkinson's, uh, and my father had Parkinson's, and my, and my uncle did. You know, we need to be with somebody who does this all day long, who really understands it. What's the latest uh, treatment? What's the understanding of the disease process? Do I still have time? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> and so I think that's that's the answer. Thank you. If I might add, I also happen to be a rabbi. I say a rabbi. Uh -huh. If you have a specialized question, I'm going to be pretty with someone who deals with it all day. Excellent. So I'm going to add, just add one thing. I don't have a problem, and we don't, sharing patients. You know, if you, somebody loves their neurologist, general neurologist, it's perfectly fine. And to use us, you know, as maybe, a, you know, alternate. alternate visits or just get our input into how we can make things better just because this is what we do all day long. Next question for Dr. Pallone, and it touches upon what you mentioned in your introduction. My doctor makes me feel like Parkinson's is a death sentence, but I keep on hearing from others that this is not your father's pain. What does that mean? Is it managed differently today with different results? Is my doctor in the dark ages? Maybe the Rambam's time? Or is it just more realistic? Not, that's not realistic at this juncture. We believe in success for our patients. And we know that at this point, there's been changes in, our, in the, the availability of medicines. That's one thing, and that's always good. However, I think it's the emphasis that has changed in, I'd say, the last 10 years on the well-being of a person. And that includes their mental well-being as well as their physical well-being. And we're going to do what we refer to as multidisciplinary care so that um, we can, in a, in a well-rounded way, take care of a patient, help a patient to do well. So I think part of it is, is truly that there's more emphasis in these years on attitude and exercise, and the, how much of a difference that that actually makes in, in success. And we both have, like I say, um, examples of that 
and we have patients, unfortunate patients, who have never exercised in their life, and now they have Parkinson's, and we're telling them they need to do this, and how to move them you know, forward into that and explain to them how important it is. We have other patients who are actually doing great, um, many examples of that, because they take hold of this, and they take our advice, they work in, as well with um, their community, their spirituality, um, their nutrition. I mean, there's so many things that we can do. It's not just write this prescription and see you in six months. That's, I think, one of the biggest changes, is the attention to all these details so that the whole person is well. I'm just going to add that if any doctor says that this is a death sentence, you better leave. Leave quickly. You know, that's not the right place. And as Dr. Pallone said, there are so many things we can do to slow the progression down, especially the exercise. And we see and the boxing. questions about that coming Yeah, there. the boxing program, which uh, we have an expert on the other side here. Oh, um, so we need to fight back. If we don't fight back, it'll, it may win. But if we fight back, we're definitely going to win. Thank you, Dr. Pillow. Questions yeah. for the rabbi. I don't know if questions were because someone had heard me talk before, but they're specifically related to Parkinson's. If I know that mood swings are a symptom of Parkinson's disease, how can Torah, how can Torah and Amuna help? How can Torah and belief in God help? How can I control the anxiety, depression, and dread that slip in when I'm having a bad day? So uh, what I try to address is that um, God created feelings so I know what I'm thinking. If I'm having a mood swing, it's telling me how my thoughts are going from one extreme to the other. So uh, we always have a choice in the next thought. It's never not that way. I can experience the sensation of something outside of me causing me to feel this consistently. But then we have to answer the question, how do I get myself distracted when I pick up the phone or I actually don't pick up the phone because I don't want to answer it? Um, so that means that I'm in control. It's a little bit like pop-ups, which you're probably familiar with. You get a pop-up on your screen and you have two options, press explore or delete. So thoughts are a little bit like pop-ups. Um, you can explore for as long as you want, and you can cross-reference to a lot of other things. You can end up a long time exploring, and it might end up taking me to a lot of other places. That's how thought works, too. Or I can press delete. Now, there's no delete button over here. You don't need one, because it's the next thought. You can, you can distract yourself or choose to go somewhere else. Uh, read the book, exercise, call a friend. There are many ways I can um, press delete. But the main, the main point about the mood swing is to recognize where it's really coming from. It's thought in the moment, and we're always living that way. It's, 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 it may sound difficult at first to grasp this, but as you remind yourself when you get a feeling and ask, where's that coming from? Oh, I'm thinking about it. And then you, then you know if you want to continue that or not. Thank you, Rabbi Rietti. A question for Dr. Rizak. Should I hold off taking dopamine? Could there be a negative impact in taking dopamine for a long time? It's been suggested I delay taking it for as long as possible. Would you agree with this, doctor? No, I, I generally don't uh, agree with that philosophy. And just to clarify that we don't actually take dopamine, even though we have dopamine, we use it in the ICU when people have very low blood pressures. The problem is that dopamine doesn't get into the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, which doesn't allow certain large molecules to get into the brain, and dopamine is that kind of a large molecule. So we've tricked the uh, blood-brain barrier, so to speak. We use a precursor of dopamine, which is L-DOPA, and that's what gets into the brain. It becomes and can be, it's converted to dopamine by the dopamine neurons uh, that can use it. Um, the reason... So everything has to be done judiciously and carefully when we use medicines. And so if a patient can be managed with a different medicine other than L-DOPA, 
we do it. And we have many medicines. We have great medicines, <coughs> new medicines. Some of them are in the back. Um, but on the other hand, L-DOPA remains the best medicine that we have for treating the symptoms. It's a double-edged sword. The higher the dose, the longer you're on it, the more likely we are to develop side effects, which would include dyskinesias, uh, the extra movements that we see. Michael J. Fox has them. So people think those extra movements are Parkinson's. They're really not. They're a side effect of the medication in the setting of where his Parkinson's disease is. Uh, so we, especially in young patients with Parkinson's, we try to minimize the use of L-DOPA early on. We use it when we need to because it is a great drug. Um, so to hold off on using uh, L-DOPA before, uh, for some theoretical, probably impractical reasons, so that a person suffers and may have falls and not be able to be fun functional is, makes no sense at all. And so the philosophy now, and, and I agree with, we use L-DOPA when we need it in the dose that will achieve our goal, but not too much medicine, just enough what we need. And L-DOPA comes in a m many formulations. There's a long-acting form, a brand name called Riteri. There's immediate release forms. There's uh, orally dissolvable forms. There's forms that can be delivered through a tube that goes right into the small bowel uh, called Duopa. Uh, so there are many options for L-DOPA, and some, I think, are better than others. I think, in general, anything long-acting in terms of medications for Parkinson patients is better for them. And there's a lot of theoretical talk about that, but, so I won't go into that. But I think it's a mistake to hold off on using L-DOPA when it's appropriate, when a person needs it. It is the most efficacious drug we have for the symptoms uh, of Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Dr. Rizak. A question for Dr. Pallone. Is there a relationship between the brain and the gut and PD? There appears to be. Uh, that is uh, research in progress. One of the things that we know is that if in your brain, as you may be aware, the part of what we can see um, on a um, microscope when we look at the brain is that you have Lewy bodies in your brain. You can find the same thing in the gut, actually. You can find Lewy bodies there as well. And also the theory is knowing that the fact uh, patients who, who have Parkinson's disease might have been constipated or have bowel changes for five, ten years before they ever um, are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So it is all that along with changes in sense of smell, um, a, a particular type of sleep disorder where you're acting out your dreams and some of you may be um, having that. Those are, are like the premotor signs, we call them. So back to the gut is that it, there's something probably changing in the gut before um, the motor signs of Parkinson's are present. And there's a lot of research right now looking at the gut um, microflora. So imbalance in bacteria in our gut might have something to do with ultimately creation of um, Lewy bodies possibly. And then from there, um, they actually move through the body to other areas. So yes, there is a connection. What to do about that to change um, Parkinson's itself, it's still not known. We have, oh geez, about 150 trillion bacteria in our gut, which isn't a very pleasant thought to think about. But um, they're there for a purpose, but imbalance, imbalance in those uh, in the the gut microflora probably contributes to other illnesses as well as Parkinson's. Thank you Dr. Pallone. Question for Rabbi Rietti and I'll combine two questions uh, due to the time constraints. How do we continue to see our value as a person when realistically we cannot accomplish or contribute like we used to and as a follow-up I've always been a giver and now that my physical ability to give is diminished, I don't like the feeling that I'm more of a taker. So how do I not let this get me down? Excellent question. Uh, so I, I think there's a confusion um, in assuming that if my body is slowing down and not letting me be as mobile, agile, 
um, hand-leg coordination as before. The confusion is that that means I have less to contribute. So the examples I, I began at the very beginning, Wendy Sergeci, um, who's seven years stage four cancer, she's going around the country helping people recognize I am not cancer. I'm not Parkinson's. My body has Parkinson's. I am not Parkinson's. My body has cancer. I am not. And she explains how she's not spending the day uh, feeling sorry for herself or in resentment or wondering I'm going to die from this or this is just going to uh, disintegrate my whole life. My quality of life is different. Instead, she's focusing on the real me. It's not my body. Um, I gave the example of Christopher Reeve, who at one particular point in his in his um, struggle uh, said to his wife, why do you still love me? He's a quadriplegic. His, he needed his wife and an assistant to dress him, and it took two hours every morning. I know some ladies take that long anyway, but it took, it took, <laughs> ten, it took two hours to dress him each morning. Um, and he asked her, why do you still love me? Her answer was simple, but it was also so profound. He actually wrote his autobiography based on her answer. She said to him, I, I love you because you're still you. He wrote a book called Still Me. Still was a pun on the fact that his body couldn't move. But the real me, that hadn't changed. In fact, that had improved. Because he, he discovered that the real me is not my body. The real me is my mind. And with that, he turned his life around. He um, founded what still exists is the Christopher and Donna Reeve Foundation of over $120 million um, for spinal injury research, and he spent the rest of his mobile life in uh, on a wheelchair visiting quadriplegics, teenagers, in hospital or at homes, showing them the research that has breakthroughs every few weeks that promises that in their lifetime, they'll be able to move their limbs again. So he gave them hope, and this gave him much more meaning to his life. So I would, I would never say that because my body has um, been if you want to call it relegated to um, a lower status of function, that that equals a, um, I'm, I'm now um, relegated to a lower quality of life. That's never true, because whatever meaning you find in your life is over here. Um, if I'm feeling I'm a taker, well, right now maybe I do need to take and celebrate that I've got the people in my life who are caring enough to take, but, but the real giving is over here, meaning to say, um, how can I be a better role model of a father, parent, uncle, aunt, uh, grandparent, to the people who are still in my life, that if I leave this world, and the memory I leave behind is, grandpa went through a really difficult disease, and he smiled throughout. He was always giving, listening, loving, empathic, compassionate, understanding, funny, humorous. So that, that, that is an enormous message for people around to hear that if, God forbid, they find themselves in a situation where their body is, so to speak, relegated to a lower level of functioning, that doesn't change who I am and the memories I'm going to leave behind of the quality of life and quality of person that I am. And so I think that's the distinction I'm trying to bring out. Uh, you're never your body, ever. You're always your mind. And in a, in a funny way, an ironic way, sometimes when the body is functioning less, it is actually an opportunity for a person to pay more attention to what really matters the most. How loving am I in my marriage with my children, in my spouse, a caring of my employees, etc.? And that's all a mindset. It's not what your body does or doesn't do. Thank you, Rabbi Rieri. If I may take a moment just to add, the Talmud is a story of a rabbi, Rabbi Zaira, who would never accept gifts. However, if the governor invited him for a meal, he would partake in it. And the reason, he says, they feel honored by my presence, so I'm going to eat with them. So really, even if a person's in a situation where they must take, taking could also be a form of giving. And if a great aunt of mine would give me a gift, from a hundred years ago, that today my modern cell phone doesn't work with it, I would gracefully tell her thank you and make her feel that she really contributed 
whether or not I had value for it. So giving could be taking and taking could be giving, and it is it requires a shift of the mind. May I make one comment about that? Is very important is that the caretaker, the person that is supporting you in your life with your Parkinson's, is also our concern. We want to make sure that we're helping that person to help you, and they're under stress as well. So we help as best we can to support them, to help them have the attitude that helps to take care of you. Because it is hard to be humbled and to be taking help, but it's also hard for the person who's giving you that help if your attitude is angry, negative, and frustrated. So it's catchy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rizak, sometimes when I take my medicine, there are fluctuations. I have periods where I feel on and periods where I feel off. How do I handle that? And what does it signify? Maybe we just turn them all off. We can talk mine, pretty loud. Mine, mine is on. Yeah. So I, we can do deep brain stimulation, but it's hard to use these microphones. So I don't know. Complicated world. Um, so I, if I recall the question, I, I need some help on that. Fluctuations. Uh, fluctuations. How do we manage fluctuations? So as Parkinson's disease progresses over time, uh, the medicines may not work as reliably. And people can have, there's all, we have a lot of names for the phenomenon or the phenomenology of these fluctuations. So some people have, uh, there's on when people are really doing well uh, and the medicines are working, and there's off when the medicines are not working so well or sometimes not working at all, uh, where you're stiff and frozen, have a lot of tremor. And sometimes there's states in between. And Dyskinesias can occur, so that can be on with dyskinesias where extra movements occur. And it's, it is related to two things. One is how you're absorbing your medicine, especially with L-DOPA. Remember, L-DOPA is not absorbed in the stomach. It's absorbed in the small bowel. So it has to get through the stomach to the small bowel. And many times there's a very erratic gastric emptying in Parkinson's, and that's one of the variables that we deal with when people are having motor fluctuations. Uh, the other variable that we can't really control that well is the dopamine receptors. They can become more sensitive at times, and sometimes they're less sensitive. So they upregulate, they downregulate. Sometimes it occurs related to the day-night cycle. Sometimes it has nothing to do with it. Um, and so when these things happen, you know, and we can actually plot this out based on we ask patients to keep a diary. When do they take their medicine? When are they off? When are they on? Uh, what happens through 24, 48 hours? And if we can see a pattern, we can adjust the medicines to cover those fluctuations. We can make uh, the medicines work appropriately or as best we can to last all day long, so without any of those fluctuations. But we need patients to take their medicines at the designated time so we can figure out how can we adjust medicines? Which medicines might be better for a patient? Sometimes there's a, a couple of medicines that can actually increase the quality of the on time. So we say quality on time, that means on time without dyskinesias. Um, very actually safe and uh, low side effect profile for these medicines. So it's about understanding the details of how these fluctuations take place and under what circumstances that allow us to make uh, changes and to help you. I think one of the other things, and I'll mention this, is that anything, so I always tell patients, you're like the space shuttle, you know, and everybody, my nurses usually get tired of hearing it, but anything that isn't working right in the space shuttle is not good, you know, like an O-ring. In a Parkinson <laughs> patient, anything that's not working right, any stress on your body, an infection, um, stress, mental stress, worries, things like that, will affect your control of the Parkinson's symptoms. And so when somebody, Dr. Pallone and I see somebody a week ago, they're doing great, everything's wonderful, we get a call, 
it's terrible. We can't walk. The tremors are, are really odd. I'm like, wait a minute, what's, what's going on? The first thing we do is in, investigate what's going on in the house, you know, relationship. But we then send patients to the lab to get urine, blood, a chest x-ray, because Parkinson's doesn't change overnight. Like, there is something else going on. And I've had patients who wouldn't, didn't tell me, but they had an infected toe. Nobody knew. The family didn't know. When they got to the emergency room, somebody took their shoes off, and there was, a, there was an infected toe. And once that was treated, everything gets back to baseline. So, you know, Parkinson's patients are delicate in a sense that it doesn't take much. But it also, all these fluctuations can be controlled uh, with consultation with the doctor so we know what's going on. And if you have anything to add to that. I think you said it well. <laughs> What do I know about boxing? I don't. I don't. Why is it? Why is it why not being certified? It certified for like. You mean for? I'm not sure what the question is. You mean certified by insurance companies or coverage? Boxing. Boxing. So why is boxing not covered by insurance companies? Am I correct? Because it's not being certified. Yeah, so what... So the what thing about boxing is it's not a medical procedure, number one. So you cannot say that, okay, this insurance covers medical procedures, right? Uh, doctor recommended the thing... Um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, doctor recommends there's a medical, trained medical professional that oversees your therapy. Boxing is not, it's not a medical procedure. So it's an exercise program, it's an exercise regime, and typically when you see boxers, they're all in great shape. And I see too many boxers out of shape, why? They're constantly exercising. But again, it's not a medical process. It's an athletic process. So insurance does not cover your athletic uh, requirements. So I want to play baseball. Insurance companies aren't going to cover that. I want to play soccer. What do they care? Do it on your own. So it's not a medical, uh, uh, um, the medical realm, per se. However, it has shown study after study that boxing, because of its forced intense exercise uh, regime, uh, promotes better Parkinson's, um, how should I put it? Control function. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Anti Parkinson's function. I like it. All right. I like it. Parkinson's takes away your uh, balance, takes away your stability, uh, your breathing, um, it gives you your voice. Where boxing is just the opposite. We train on how to have better balance, how to improve our st stability. You know, when you're fighting someone, if you're losing your balance, falling down, you're going to lose the fight. Boxing, we train how to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with our opponent. You're breathing to bring out the most, most, more forceful uh, actions from your arms, from your legs, uh, to use your voice, to speak out, to bring power from the inside. Power, this is not power. This is strength. Power is inside. You've got to bring it out. Same thing. Parkinson's, you want to overcome. You need power. Strength is not going to help you. Strength is good. Power is better. So we, when you put them together, you become invincible. You know, so that's what boxing does. But again, it's not recognized as a medical procedure. That's the problem. The more doctors know about it, these doctors are great. They're sharing, they're spreading. I have one, uh, one of my boxers, his doctor told him, look at Rock, you, you, congratulations, you have Parkinson's. Go find the Rocksteady Boxing Program. The same day, I believe he called Mrs. Lust. Mm -hmm. The same day. Mm -hmm. And it's, he's been with me now for two months. And it's the greatest thing ever. Right, because he is moving better. For two years, he didn't know what's going on. He's using a leaf blower. It's blowing him away instead of the leaves. He didn't know what's going on. <laughs> he went to his doctor, you know, and, not, and he, this is a younger gentleman. He's only in his uh, early 50s. And he's noticing he's not swinging the sledgehammer like he used to. What's going on? He finally went to the doctor, and the usual, congratulations, you have Parkinson's. But he didn't tell him, get your affairs in order. He told him, find Rocksteady Boxing. And sure enough, he's only a couple of miles away, and first thing he did was call, found it, and, and he's been going great with it. So, but, and back to your answer, I, mean, I can talk for hours about this stuff. <laughs> 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 you know? But yeah. it's not medical procedure. 
So until the doctors get on board, until we convince uh, the doctors that this is a necessity, doctors are going to convince the insurance company this is a necessity. Medication, eh, side effects. I <laughs> rarely do hear side effects to exercise. Okay, a little soreness. That's because you're doing it right. Okay? But it's not life-threatening. And of course, you, of course, you need a professional. The other thing, too, is, is how do we gauge who's the professional running you through a program? That's the other problem. There's no uh, set guidelines. Obviously, you want a coach that knows what he's doing. You don't want to go somewhere where they're going to break your back, telling you, oh, go do this, and you come, you go. So that's the other problem. There's no set standards either. It's really up to you as the practitioner. You go to a place, okay, does the instructor know what he's doing? Does he have experience? Uh, what are other people saying about it, right? right. What are other people saying about it? <laughs> All right. That's how you know if that's the right instructor. Mm -hmm. And, of course, is everybody else walking out in one piece or they're being carried out? <laughs> Although in my class, if you carry it out, that's okay. I just want to tell you that this is where... Um, I want to tell you that we're working on it now because this is, this is a major, major, major question and a major problem that we are encountering. And uh, I brought in uh, somebody, I, he doesn't want me to mention his name, but I'm going to mention it anyways, Rabbi Rubenfeld. I'm working with him and, his, uh, and uh, somebody else. And we're working on the fact to try to convince the state and the government to understand that there's really, this is the only way that people will get better. At this point, I don't know, the doctor knows more than the other things, but at this point, exercise is a major, major thing. And the governments are, like, like Yuri said, the governments are not interested in hearing it, and we're 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 trying to bring. Uh, there's a place in Bnei Brak that we've contacted, and they're sending us papers showing clearly that people have changed because of exercise, and um, we're hoping to prove these things in the coming future, and uh, really get some answers to this, why the government and the Medicaid will not pay for it. Well, just quickly, just, you know, we used to tell our patients to exercise, it's good for you, and we really didn't have any science behind it. We saw patients getting better and actually slowing the progression now. Now we actually have science. They've done a few experiments, animal experiments, where we can make the animals Parkinsonian with certain chemicals. One group got to exercise, the other group didn't. And when we looked at the brains, there was a huge difference. The, one, the group that exercised actually had re-sprouting of some of the neurons, of the axons that are going to the basal ganglia from the dopamine cells, increased neurotrophic factors, which are like preservatives for the cells. And it really, finally, we have some data that says this is what's really happening in the brain. We're actually protecting the neurons you have and the neurons that were injured, you're going to have some regrowth. And that explains why patients who exercise, and you don't have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, you just have to move aerobic exercise. I think boxing is great. Uh, you get strengthening and, you know, the breathing and the, all the thing, camaraderie. I think it's really a good social setting. Um, but it's, it's imperative. I mean, I think we can do, we can throw pills at everybody. We do, uh, but it's it really part of the management. that's only There's half no of the doubt. management. The other half is what you do for yourself, and people can do well for decades now, as long as we both all participate. How much exercise should we do? I mean, I I would like every day, but I think three to four times a, a week, at least 15, 20 minutes, where your heart rate goes up just a little bit. Walking is better than not walking, but you know you want to increase your heart rate a little bit safely. You want to check with your doctor that it's okay to do that. Sometimes it's in a mall or someplace in the winter. Sometimes on a treadmill, uh, but um, it, it, time and time and time again. You want to. There's a something? terminology that's also been used as forced exercise. 
Uh, they did the, the pedaling studies, the biking studies, and they weren't just going on a leisurely uh, pace. They were doing 80, 90 revolutions per minute. So it, it's got to be a little uncomfortable um, to make progress. Got to get that heart rate up. You're going to breathe harder, but that's, you know, that's part of the exercise. You do, that gradu you do it gradually. You don't start doing that immediately. That's expected that a person who exercises, especially when you have Parkinson's because it's harder to move in the beginning especially and you're deconditioned, you're going to be tired and you're going to have to take a nap and recoup, but that gets better over time as long as you continue it. If you give up because, hey, I'm so tired, I can't even eat uh, dinner, you have to fight through that and that's temporary and it will pass. Very, I mean... We can't emphasize it enough. The science is there now. It isn't just the doctor saying, go exercise. It's, it's all there. But Dr. Rizek, is the reason he's tired because of the exercise, or could it be because the medication is going on the low? That's because the, sometimes I've seen the exercise where the person is the same before and after, where they didn't really exercise or exert themselves, but then I've heard, oh, they're tired. But they came in tired in the first place. Oh, so did the excess make them tired, or is it Parkinson's, or the side effect of the medication? Because medication goes, oh, you got the highs and lows sometimes, where you got the lows, you're not really moving so much. Well, you know, those, have to, that, those are things that have to be sorted out based on the individual patient. There are patients, not a huge number, but there are patients that kind of use up their medicine faster when they exercise. Not many. It kind of, we're trying to figure out why that happens, but there are. And in those cases, uh, you feel tired, you feel slow. You might have to take an extra dose maybe before you start the exercising. When, once we figure that out, that that's the case, there are things, there are strategies we can do. So it could be any of the things you mentioned, but I think, that, again, micromanagement, that's what we do, figure out what it is, and then we can make adjustments to cover whatever problem areas there are. Thanks. I'd just like to ask one more question, and then we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. Touches upon what we're looking to do with the organization. My doc, I'll ask Dr. Pillow. All right. My, my doctor advised me not to tell my co workers, family, or friends that I was diagnosed with PD, the concern of stigma, and suggested that I avoid support groups because perhaps seeing others with more severe symptoms would make me fearful of my own future. What is your response to such advice? There's several uh, questions, I would say, in there. And if a person is still working, uh, they may not want to tell their coworkers. And it depends on um, where they are with their Parkinson's and how many problems that they're having. And they're not required to tell their coworkers, for sure. But on the other hand, I do think it's important to include your family. And I think that, you know, that was touched on as well. We have to. Um, include people so that they can be of help to us and so that they can understand us. Um, we, we talked about before and uh, amongst ourselves is that, you know, patients will sometimes lose their facial expression, of course, with Parkinson's. And if you don't tell the people around you, especially the ones you're close to, um, that you don't have that facial expression, it's not because you're mad at them. It's not because you don't care. It's the Parkinson's. And so I think there are a lot of reasons why including the family in uh, the Parkinson's is so important and I would definitely you know tell family and, and friends trusted friends because they're gonna be part of your support they're gonna be part of your good energy I like to call it um, finding the ways to give yourself some good energy every day and help us to get that better attitude so I would definitely include um, family and, and close friends and there was a... To avoid support groups. Because oh, okay. you may see others... Can I just add? Can we get to that last quote yeah. before? Certain. I think, in general, the stress on people hiding it from well, coworkers is yeah. not good. And mm -hmm. if you think coworkers don't notice that you're having more trouble typing or tremoring, they, people notice this. And if they don't... If you are come out with what it is and explain it to them... Um, they don't think you have some fatal disease because you don't and that you're getting treated for it. And sometimes, and it's not every situation, there are hostile environments that you have to take into consideration, but in general, I think it's usually better 
to come out with it because to hold it in and to try to mask everything, it's a lot of stress. So, but I also think if that's the case, you need to try to help educate them because you can't, you know, you tell them you have Parkinson's disease, but you know, I'm I'm well, I can do my job, I'm doing okay, but just so you know, if you see me shake. You know, so that it's not an, it, it's, it, you need to educate them as well to take that a little step further so that they understand that you can, you are still you and you can still do your job and those things. So, and as far as the support group question, that varies according to the support group, to be honest with you. I mean, there are support groups that aren't working on the positivity. Uh, aspect of how to do well with Parkinson's. And so sometimes it's it's really kind of the aura of the support group, um, the feeling that you're going to get at the support group. Some people don't want to go because they are going to see people who are sicker than them. Um, but we're going to do everything we can in our power and you're going to do everything in your power to put that off, put, may not be like that for, for 20 years. You, if you're comparing yourself, if you're going to sit there and look at the people around you and compare yourself and say, oh, and make it an anxious time, um, make it a frustration time, make it a worry in your mind, then I don't think that that's healthy. But if you can go there with your own positive attitude and bring a positive attitude maybe to them, then you're contributing, um, I, then that can be a positive thing for you. So it just it depends on the situation, the support group that you find. I mean, obviously, you know, sparks of life. Um, it's it's all about that spark. It's about that energy, and it's about lot, not losing it. So as usual, I have to just add one thing, <laughs> and that is that every patient is different with Parkinson's disease. So comparing yourself to another patient is not appropriate. It really isn't, even though it feels like it might be. And it also depends on how your how your doctor is managing your symptoms. Some people are better managed than others. Seeing a doctor every six months for Parkinson's is not appropriate. Um, it should be seen you know more often. And so it's really it's they say if you've seen one person with Parkinson's, you've seen one person with Parkinson's because everybody is different. And the key is micromanagement, exercise. Developing a positive attitude. I think, Rabbi, we should be teaching our children early on how to think positive. I mean, I, I, I could have used that. But um, anyway, um, I think we just have to keep in mind that this is, for most people with Parkinson's, if you're managed carefully and correctly, you can do well for decades and decades and forever. You know, so people, I think the old fit. I had a patient that went to the, a doctor in La Jolla. I know she got to me in Chicago, but the first thing he did was showed her a video of a person in a wheelchair. This is what happens. She completely freaked out. Somehow she got my name. She came to Chicago, and of course, inappropriate, not true, and it was totally demoralizing. It took a while to get her out of that uh, funk, that state. And um, so there are, I mean, there's a range of things that are out there, but finding the right person that's compatible with you, good doctor-patient relationship, I say good patient-doctor relationship, is really important. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience. Sure. Gluten-free food. Is there any oh. benefit of having gluten-free food for Parkinson's patients? Not, no, there's no data on that. No. There's no evidence for that. There have been some reports, you know, it's singular reports of patients who went gluten-free and then they did better. Maybe it has to do with their absorption, again, because people who have gluten sensitivity do have problems with their bowels. So maybe in some cases then they were had a better absorption of their medication and that's why they did better. But no the the CBD oil. The CBD oil is something that should be considered. You want to take that or <laughs> well, I am. No, I mean it's it's a question we get every day. All frankly. the time. It is. And uh, not only that, but people bring marijuana into the office, and uh, that's against. The and but today I actually had somebody bringing marijuana, and I'm like, eh, put it away. Um, but there's no data on it. See, the problem is we don't know how. CBD oil, THC, marijuana is going to interact with the brain with medicine on board too. There's just nobody studied it yet. And so the general consensus is 
Not to recommend it. I'm sorry? Does it have a side effect? It, can, it might, because we don't know. It hasn't been studied, and everybody's a little bit different And you know, with Parkinson's. It may have no negatives. We don't know, but it just hasn't been studied. So for a medical doctor to say take a, another drug that's um, gonna, psychoactive, it's going to work in your brain, we just, you know, we don't feel 100% comfortable. It's a very important question because it is something that people are hearing about every day. They're seeing testimonials on the Internet, and um, I always say testimonials are not things that have been tested. Um, unfortunately, it, it's, it, it, you can't go by that because you, it's a snapshot in time of a person showing you how they did or, or saying how they did. Um, what, what we know mostly is CBD oil is probably not toxic. Um, THC, on the other hand, uh, that can cause problems with Parkinson's patients for their motor control, for their cognitive function, for their balance. So that's, you know, definitely I would not encourage that. Um, and to know that you don't, we don't have any control over what your, what is at the dispensary. There is no actual knowledge of what's in that medical marijuana that you're getting. There, there's, no, there's no regulation of that. The CBD oil you can get from Amazon. Um, you can hemp get that oil. from Amazon, hemp mm -hmm. oil. You know, so theoretically it's benign. But again, you know, for us to recommend it, it would be like, we, we just don't, honestly, we don't know. We don't know for sure. It's a, a melatonin you can get over the counter. We know that that's safe. Uh, but we don't know enough about CBD. If somebody wants to try it, I don't really discourage them. I just, I personally don't discourage it. I just say, we don't know. You can try it. And what's important is if you are trying it, tell your doctor you're trying it. They need to know everything that you're taking supplements, anything that's non-prescription, anything that's over the, please tell, tell us everything that you're taking. And we want to work with you. We have patients that are more, want to do more uh, complementary management. I need to know that. I need to work with them if that's what they want to do. Now, I'm also going to tell them when I think that they need, you know, prescription medications and make sure that they're doing all the other things right. But please tell your doctor everything that you're taking, everything you're putting in your body. I'm sorry? Does Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease cause dementia? I think some patients with Parkinson's disease will develop a dementia. Usually it's in the late stages of the illness, very, in, more, in, in very advanced stages. Now, there's, uh, there's always a... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, so the is Parkinson's related to dementia? Can it cause dementia? dementia. Yeah. Thank you. That's why you need a good doctor. You know, we, is it a, related to uh, confusion from the medications that a patient might appear, may appear to have a dementia? Uh, or is it actually a true dementia? And it's a very specific kind of dementia that occurs in Parkinson's patients, not Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, th that's only determined by the doctor going over your, the medications, the doses of the medicines. It may be reducing some of the medicines that have the potential to do that, to determine whether it is contributing to confusion and memory problems. But mm -hmm. so. And it, and it is manageable as well, by the way, including exercise and good sleep. I'd like to just take one final question to someone who has a question. One final question from the paper. Okay. No. Uh, does Parkinson's have to have an effect on vision? So it doesn't have an effect on visual acuity. Um, it, some of the medicines that we potentially could be prescribing for Parkinson's might affect the eye. Um, so your, oh, thank you. Uh, so if you're 2020 or 2040 or 2050 when you get your eyes checked and whether you need glasses and do you need lenses, it doesn't affect any of that. Um, some of our medications might cause some blurring vision. So if you're having that, definitely still tell the doctor. There's a small percentage of Parkinson's patients that get double vision. It's maybe 15% of patients. Um, and that may be a variety of reasons for that. So we do want to know about visual changes. but. Usually from medication, dry eyes because we stare, 
Um, Parkinson's patients have that stare, so they're not blinking enough. And their eye can be dry. Um, always important to get to the eye doctor. Important to have good vision. Helps prevent falls and helps keep your mind sharper. And you can um, see things better and be safer. But also um, getting to the eye doctor, make sure you don't have glaucoma. I mean, all of those things. But it's really not directly Parkinson's. Can I add something to that? I think in general, I agree. In general, but no. So I think there are a couple of things that occur sometimes, and that is something called convergence insufficiency in Parkinson's patients, where the eyes, for close vision, mm -hmm. they may not focus on the exact same spot. You know, so you may one eye will be getting one image to the brain, and it'll be a little bit off, and that's blurry. You'll get a, a blurry vision. The eye doctor can tell if that's the case because they can measure the deviation in the eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that nobody really talks about is um, a decrease in contrast sensitivity. And that is so like if somebody's driving, sometimes they don't, if the line, you know, is not really sharp visual and it's spatial. like, yeah, it's, and they, and visual spatial arrangement, they may park on the curb, they hit the curb before they and it's because they're not perceiving the distance and the depth quite right. So that occurs in some people. Like almost everything in Parkinson's, it occurs in some people. So a lot of people, when they hear these things, well, when is that going to happen to me? It probably won't. You know, it's just, it's very individual. When it occurs... It happened to my husband, and the, the, the eye doctor doesn't seem to address it too well. What do I have to look after? So, yeah. so, the, so the question is, who should you see who's a good doctor um, to evaluate these eye problems? So if the regular eye doctor is not really pursuing it or not giving you good answers, there are neuro-ophthalmologists that will specialize in um, eye movement disorders. Neuro-ophthalmologists. Neuro-ophthalmologists. They subspecialize in any in neurologic disease. In the neurology disease. of the eyes. Yeah. So I would like to thank all of our panelists mm -hmm. tonight. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Um, as you notice, I'm a little bit of a shorty, so maybe uh, I can't see me too well. But that's all right. After such giant people who spoke tonight, so I don't have too much to say. But um, I must tell you, I, um, I've learned a lot. First of all, Rabbi Yuredi, this is the first time I heard you speak, and uh, I want you to know, if I have the time between all the phone calls that I get, I'm on to Torah anytime. I want to hear you. I appreciate you coming tonight. I know you're busy. I, I know what it means to be busy. And uh, really, really, I was in awe and very inspired by what you spoke, really. Uh, Dr. Rizak and Dr. Pallone, I want you to know, I must tell you, you make a team. Why? When one finishes, the other one ends off the other. <laughs> So you're a good team. But uh, I must tell you that I'm more and more convinced that I did the right thing. I, uh, I am in awe as a, as a person who has Parkinson's from Dr. Rizak since the time, and Dr. Pallone since the time that I went up to Newburgh and I spent almost two hours and I was in awe and I came home, and I couldn't sleep that night. Because I told my wife, this is the type of doctor that is needed for a person with Parkinson's. Sensitive, both of them. Interested, and really, really wants to help the person. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I... Uh, I must tell you that every time I see that we make another event, I get better and better 
at speaking. <laughs> it took a while, but I'm getting there. I just don't have a partner. But um, I must tell you that the Ben Shalom has helped us in becoming this organization in three years' time. Somebody once told me in Baker Choylem of Lakewood, and he was interviewing me. He said, how long did it take you to make what you did today, what you organized until now? And I told him, three years. He says, I don't believe you. He says, because it should have taken eight years at least to get to where the point that you are. <laughs> the Ben Shalom has helped us immensely in making this where we are today, I must tell you. And Baruch Hashem, the Ben Shalom is sending me lately, Baruch Hashem, I'm working hard, but we're, I can't say now what we're becoming, but I've, I'm having a lot of meetings, and in Mitz Hashem, with Abishta's help, I think in two years we'll have a center in Mansi, a complete building for ourselves. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to two people. One is, um, I'm going to talk about my nephew who's in charge of the run. I just want to let you know that at this point, the run is the only place where we have fundraising for this organization. And all of the money cannot goes to the center. We made, because of my nephew, Ramesha Tzvi Sarabrovsky, we made last year $194,000 by the run. That is not Shaykh without his help. So I'm going to let him speak, and after that, I'm going to talk just for two seconds after he talks. He's not going to take long because he has the shear to go to, so you know that he's not going to talk long. But um, there's another person that I'm going to introduce that I think is very, very important for the senior community of, of, of the Orthodox community and for any community. Well, if everybody's already here, I think I just might decide to give my share here. You probably all have enough time. No. Um, I'm going to keep this to 90 seconds or less. Baruch Hashem, over the last two years, we started a five-kilometer run that is a three-mile run, Labor Day weekend around Rockland Lake. Last year, we had over 250 participants of people that ran you have the ability, we have a children's run up to 14 years old, which is a one mile run. And we have a five kilometer run for adults. We had quite a few people involved. We have corporate sponsorships available. If there's anybody that either knows somebody or that they, they themselves would like to participate or sponsor runners, which is the way that we raise the money, um, we have a website. Uh, powerupforparkinsons.com on the way out. You can get more information about that. And Bezos Hashem, we're looking forward to increase from nearly 200000 We're hoping to raise a goal of $360,000 this year between now and September 1st. So if there's anybody that you know that could either contribute, that wants to run, wants to take part in the unbelievable event, it's a great family day. Families, we had oh, close to probably a thousand people attend the event between men, women, and children that came as spectators to watch the event uh, with a full barbecue, a family day carnival, and all the extras, brand new surprises coming this year. Thank you very much. Before I go to the next person, uh, I want to thank, first of all, Susan Lust. Um, 
When I first met Susan for the first time, I said to myself, I don't know if I'll ever keep up with her. Because she's always 10 steps ahead of me. This is all her, this whole thing. And really, it's unbelievable and very professional. The next person that I want to thank is Rabbi Teichman for coming out here as a, as a moderator. Really, really special. And I want to thank the whole staff of, uh, of uh, what you call the Parkinson's studio, the Sparks of Life studio. That's uh, Mrs. Berger. Um, uh, what you call it? Um, I forgot uh, the name. Um, um, what? No, no. Forgot your, your name. Okay. You know who I mean. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. And um, and and uh, Hani Foyer. And I'd like to thank also the pharmaceutical companies that came and sponsored this event. Metronic and Adamas, and thank you really, really, because as you see, it's really, really was special. And then finally, I'd like to thank Yuri. He's always keeping a whip over me when I come. And with that, and Hani Foyer, who's, uh, who's been, who unfortunately we couldn't keep on staff, but she's always helping. Thank you. And Susan's daughter. Okay. And the final but final, I'm going to give over to the person who speaks about something that's very important. You know, as we get older, we can't get to the phone if we fall or anything like that. It's very common, unfortunately. And a younger man really something is somebody special went ahead and made a responder that you can put on your neck but it goes straight to Hatsala. he'll explain it to you and we'll give him the the uh, microphone for a few minutes and he'll explain it to you and thank you once again for coming and have a good night thank you very much for your introduction Robert Groskin. Thank you to all those who made this event so successful tonight. Very, very inspirational. My name is Moshe Chaim Suisa. I'm here to uh, represent the company J Responder. Uh, we have a medical device, medical alert device, uh, which is geared towards the senior community. And uh, it has some exclusive features, which I will talk to you briefly about. And if you'd like, you could come see me at my booth uh, after the, the end of the event. Um, it's a medical device that you wear all the time on yourself. Um, it has a 30-day battery charge, so you never have to take it off. And um, you never have to worry about, having, about charging it uh, at night. So... You could even wear it under the shower. Uh, it's um, shower proof. And um, it has uh, the, the ability to um, call a call center in case uh, of a difficult situation, uh, whether the person is at home or on the go. So uh, the service that this device uses is Verizon 4G LTE, which is a um, exceptional uh, strong network uh, in this area and in most of the tri-state area. Um, it's the only device on the market that has uh, that is certified on the Verizon 4G LTE network. Um, so when the person presses the button, in case of a difficult situation, uh, it will connect to the call center and they could ask the call center to either call a relative, um, a friend, or if the situation requires it, they could, they could ask uh, for Hatsala. And uh, what Robert Groskin was saying was that we geared this device uh, to the firm community because we um, 
integrated all the numbers for Hatzalah anywhere uh, in the U.S. And whatever, whatever, wh whatever the person is, uh, all they have to say is call Hatzalah and they will know which is the closest Hatzalah to call. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an exclusive feature for uh, our community, um, but it's obviously um, available for everyone and it will call 911 in any situation where there's no Hatzalah nearby. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about it and uh, you're welcome to come and learn more or take some uh, literature. Thank you. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.